Lie number four. Most people in America are decent, and you just have to be a decent person to get to heaven. How often have you heard this? Well, you know, I'm not worried about all this heaven and hell stuff. I'm a decent guy. I'm decent, you know. Now, of course, obviously, the the person who relies on his own decent nature to get him through the pearly gates is wrong, first and foremost, because that's just not how it works. Heaven is open to us because of Christ's ultimate sacrifice, a sacrifice made necessary by our sin, not our decency. And only those who love Christ will enter into it. Your alleged decency isn't enough to earn you a spot. Your decency is nothing. You know, there's a story about St. Thomas Aquinas, the greatest theologian to ever live. Before his 50th birthday, he had written volume upon volume of theological work that would help to shape Christianity and human civilization for centuries to come. But all of a sudden, he stopped. He stopped writing, just out of nowhere. He stopped writing, and he was asked why, and he revealed that he was given a vision of heaven. And according to him, all that I have written is dust compared to what I have seen. Now, if Aquinas' work is dust, what does it say about mine? What does it say about yours? And that's, the, that's really the thing about our decency that I, that I want to focus on here. I'd like you to consider not only that your decency won't save you, but that, in fact, you are not really that decent anyway. I think there are a great many of us in this country who imagine ourselves to be decent and honest, but our decency and honesty are incidental. And that would explain why, in this country, with all these decent people, still a million babies a year are killed. Still, we have a billion-dollar porn industry. Still, we have fatherless homes, broken families. Still, we're now raising children who don't even know the difference between man and woman. We parade our sons around in dresses. We call them girls. Is this the work of a decent country? And our way of, uh, of, uh, of proving that we're a decent country is we, you know, every once in a while on Facebook, you see one of these uh, human interest uh, videos, one of these inspiring videos of someone giving to a homeless person or, you know, being nice to their neighbor. And that's great and everything. I don't mean to discount it, but number one, did you notice that they're on camera? I saw a video on Facebook the other day of a guy filming himself giving to the homeless. And it had 50 million views. And everyone's like, you're such a great guy. Okay, you know what? Turn the camera off and then do that. I'm sorry, I'm not impressed. The real measure, of course, as we know, is what you do when the cameras aren't looking at you. And I think that if we are decent, it's only because we haven't had the opportunity or the inclination to be very indecent. What I mean is that our opportunities for indecency, cowardice, dishonesty, malice, faithlessness are so seemingly small and ordinary that we don't think they count. We may actually behave like morally bankrupt lunatics on a near constant basis, but The effects are so minimal and the circumstances so insignificant that we give ourselves a pass. But here's the uncomfortable truth that I think we need to confront, many of us. We basically commit every sin we have the opportunity and the desire to commit. Hardly ever do we decline an opportunity or suppress a desire. We have been about as evil as we could be, given our situation. Now, if you want proof of this fact, let's go back to the internet for a minute. Let's not think about a YouTube star who films himself giving his shoes to a homeless guy. Think about how monstrous and despicable the average person can become when let into the anonymity of cyberspace. When given, when, when, when given the chance to say awful things to each other in you know, the comment sections or on Twitter, or to look at whatever depraved pornography they could possibly conceive in their head, when given that chance, they take it. 
their deviancy and cruelty are confined to the internet only because that's the one place they can get away with it. You find this in other places too. I can remember my days of working uh, fast food and retail where I would sometimes encounter managers so utterly intoxicated by the tiny bit of control they have over their subordinates that I used to wonder what actually separates my shift supervisor from like a third world dictator. They're both being as tyrannical and abusive as they can be in their circumstance. So if the guy who oversees the six to midnight shift at Domino's Pizza can find every conceivable way to exploit his power, one can only imagine what would happen if he had an army at his disposal. Guy's got three delivery drivers, and this is what he's doing. Imagine if he had an entire, if he had tanks. We joke sometimes about really abusive people, and we say, oh, they're worse than Hitler. And the thing is, maybe they are. Maybe they are. But what if, you know, we live our whole lives, and the opportunity for the more extreme sorts of sin never arise? What then? What if I was on the path to brutality and debauchery, but I expired before I could really get there? Will God judge me like he judges a man with hands as clean as mine, but a heart of grace and love? Or will he judge me like a man with a heart as black as mine, but hands that reflect the state of his soul? I'd say the latter, because that guy has simply done everything that I would have done had I the opportunity and gumption to pull it off. This is why it's not enough for us to be what the world would consider decent and normal, because we can be decent and normal and evil at the same time. The thing is, we have to pursue what is good and holy and consistently reject any opportunity to sin, no matter how inconsequential the sin may seem to us. So like accidentally dinging someone's car door in the parking lot and then driving away without leaving a note, that's not as bad as plowing down a pedestrian and fleeing the scene of the crime. But the one may be a precursor to the other. If I have no courage, no integrity in the smaller matter, those virtues aren't going to suddenly appear out of thin air in the more serious one. And most of us, the thing is, most of us live small lives. So our opportunities for evil will only ever be small, and our opportunities for courage will also be small. And if we never take, take advantage of the small opportunities for faith, courage, and love, then in the end it must be said that we never acted with faith, courage, or love at all. And the fact that all we've left in our wake is a bunch of dinged car doors is irrelevant. They could have been pedestrians had our luck been a little different. 